In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and have just to deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. May I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord and Savior, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive reading of the introit as printed in the bulletin. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is our help and shield. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of human hands. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. The dead do not praise the Lord. But we will bless the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is our help. to God on high.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Living God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace to lay hold of your promises and live forever in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Exodus in the third chapter. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take off the sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain." Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and, that, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading today is from the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, 
and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. Luke, the 20th chapter. Then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her as wife, and he died childless. Then the third took her, and in like manner, the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised, when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after that they dared not question him any more. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We confess our saving faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God the Son.
grace and peace to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text is from the Epistle lesson, verses 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Dear fellow redeemed, God has always rooted his people in two different places at once. He roots us in the here and the now. Because God comes to us right here, right now, and forgives us. He takes away our shame. He takes away our guilt. He assures us in no uncertain terms that Jesus' sacrifice on that cross was sufficient for our sins and that he loves us. So in the here and the now, we learn that there isn't anything else more we need to be saved than what God brings to us. And having the full load of his salvation poured out on us right now means that at this moment, we have different lives to lead, too. We can't give ourselves over willingly to just breaking God's laws as if they don't exist anymore. We're redeemed. We are washed. We're a new people with new lives to live. So now in time, God gives us what we need to resist temptation. Now he helps us talk and act in ways that are pleasing to him. It isn't that we should become more holy in the future. We are given this holiness of life right now. But God also roots us in what is yet to come. Now, ultimately for us who receive Christ's grace and forgiveness, that means that God roots us in an eternal future, one that we will share with his Son. We can look forward to that time when our weak, broken, mortal flesh will be resurrected in the glory of heaven when we will live without pain or sickness or disease anymore, we will walk and talk with angels. What is yet to come in the future is more fantastic than anything human language can describe. And it's our guarantee because of the grace Jesus gives us right now. But God's Word also lets us know that what is yet to come for us as Christians between the now and that eternal future is something not quite so bright or happy. God's Word today tells us that there is coming a period of great suffering for us as Christians. As Paul describes it to the Thessalonians, a man of lawlessness and sin will rise up and inflict terrible sorrows on God's people. Paul is describing an antichrist, who will lead people away from Jesus and make the lives of Christians brutally miserable. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This verse is actually the reason why Lutherans have historically identified the Antichrist with the papacy. Every pope sits in the temple of God and promotes teachings that say Christ's one sacrifice on the cross was not good enough to save you and that you have to add to that your own works and your deeds and the intervention of your priest and the pope Luther and the Reformers have always said they believe the Pope is the Antichrist. And yet in his epistle, St. John talks about the Antichrist and adds to our understanding of him. He says, little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even so now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that this is the last hour. So John says two important things. One, there are many antichrists, not only who will come, 
but who have come, in fact, who are coming right now. And two, the presence of those antichrists means we're living in the last days and that Christ can return at any time and put an end to this world. So in one sense, there will be an Antichrist who rises up to inflict misery on God's people. And in another sense, there are already Antichrists living who will do that. Paul describes the spirit of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians as a spirit of lawlessness. In fact, he even calls the Antichrist the lawless one. Someone who follows his own rules, who ignores God's will. And just look around you in the world today. That spirit of rebellion against the law of God is everywhere. You can't miss it. In fact, most of our political leaders, in fact, seem to be led by that sort of lawlessness, creating laws that promote and protect immorality, the murder of babies, the sin of homosexuality, using their power to advance themselves and get rich, protecting the lawlessness of special interest groups that aren't interested in peace but are trying to make war in our country. They belittle the Christian faith. They serve the religion of secularism and humanism. It's exactly what Paul says the Antichrist is all about. The Antichrist will promote hate and call it love. He will promote lies and call it the truth. Everything Christ stands for, the spirit of the Antichrist will stand against. And we are living in that time right now. Yet we need to understand that what we're experiencing right now will get worse persecution of faith that we see around us now is going to intensify. People you know are going to lose their jobs because they're Christians. Churches are going to lose their tax-exempt status and suffer a level of persecution this country has never seen. Christians are going to die here in this country like they are dying right now in the Middle East and in Africa because they believe in Jesus. Our world is under the control of the Antichrist. And for us, we better brace ourselves because God tells us it's going to get worse. So our God calls us here today into his church to give us what we need now so we can endure that then. So here, in his word today, Jesus, your Savior, declares you forgiven. You now receive the Holy Spirit of God. Because when he forgives you, he puts his Holy Spirit within you to create faith, to make faith grow, to make you stronger in his truth so you can stand in the evil days that are coming. We have to get used to the fact and prepare ourselves for the reality that we are going to face the Antichrist. And if we are honest with ourselves, we are going to have to admit that that spirit of the Antichrist that God's word speaks so harshly against is a spirit we have allowed to creep into our hearts. Because we've had other gods. We've let the love of money become too great within us. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have held grudges. We have been unforgiving. We have chosen to ignore God's word because it's just not convenient. It seemed too restrictive. We have let the spirit of the Antichrist sneak into our hearts. And if we let him stay there, he will damn us. Jesus calls us here, now, to drive that spirit from us and to put a new spirit within us, the spirit of his Holy Spirit, of faith and love of God above all else. 
every single day, your Savior washes you in your baptismal grace and renews his promises to you that he is there to save you from all sin and evil. And your Savior gives you what you need to face every single day, no matter what comes. You have an everlasting divine love, so intense and pure that Christ poured himself out into death to give you his saving grace and love. And Christ lives within you to go with you and direct you in his truth to be your source of life in the face of death and your courage in the face of persecution. It is the gospel that saves you. But in the kingdom of the lawless one, we have to also recognize the importance of the law in our lives. The mark of the Antichrist is lawlessness, the mark of Christ within us, is obedience to God's law. And God expects that of us. Not because God loves rules and regulations and wants to keep us forced into some box, but because God's laws serve love. They keep us from the evil of the lawless one and shape our lives in ways that please our Heavenly Father. Following God's laws is never going to be the cause of our salvation. But following his laws can, in fact, protect us from the shame and the misery that the rest of the world knows because of lawlessness. God's laws can keep us from being pulled into the confusion of this world and the idolatry of the Antichrist. We live every day fighting against that spirit of lawlessness. Really, we are a people who are pulled in two opposite ways simultaneously. We are pulled by the lawlessness of the world around us to follow it, and we are pulled by God and his word to follow his law. In Thessalonians, Paul tells the people, God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. God chose us to fight this fight and endure what comes on us because of this faith we confess. He chose us to be his people And he equipped us with what we need to stand in these days. God's grace given to us here is not going to make the world a better place to live in. It's not going to stop the spirit of the Antichrist from being emboldened against God's people in this lifetime. But it will preserve us. And it will give us what we need to confess before a world that won't receive Christ, and to live securely knowing we are loved by God and our past lawless deeds are not held against us. We have a Savior who died to rescue us from the consequences of our lawlessness, and his death is sufficient payment before the Father. Our souls are safe even if our flesh at times will not be. So, my friends, the times are evil, but God's grace and forgiveness are strong enough to keep us in his love now and forever. May God preserve us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Almighty God and Father, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to overcome the world for us through his cross and resurrection. Grant us grace and peace in him, that whenever troubles, tribulations, or temptations afflict us in this world of sin, that we may never forsake you, but rather be strengthened by your grace that we may bear our crosses in patience and remain faithful in Jesus till he comes again in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us, Jesus, you promise to return to bring us to your eternal kingdom. Aid us now while we remain in this life. Prepare us for the end that we may leave this valley of sorrow with gladness, that we may look forward to your return with eager expectation, and that our heart's affliction may be bound firmly and solely in you, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Eternal Father, in your wisdom you raise up leaders to restrain evil and uphold order. Indeed, all authority comes from you. Help our country now, this week, as we elect new leaders. Though we as a country have sinned against you and deserve your wrath, have mercy on us for the sake of your elect. Give us leaders who will protect our right to worship you in peace, who will promote moral goodness, and who will protect the lives of the unborn. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful Lord Jesus, look with compassion on those who in distress call out to you for help this day. Remember the sick, the homeless, the discouraged, the lonely and homebound, and those who face medical treatments. Grant them patience in their afflictions, confidence in your steadfast love and mercy, and according to your gracious goodwill, grant them speedy healing, health, and relief. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, together with all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our 
Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.